Here I have an infinite line of charge. Let rho sub L represent the charge density, and that will be in coulombs per meter. And let's place this line of charge along the z-axis. And what we want to do is find the electric field intensity due to this infinite line of charge. And let's pick some arbitrary point P here at which we want to find the electric field intensity. If we take a differential length dz, the amount of charge in that differential length is dq given by rho sub L times dz. So let uppercase R represent the vector that points from dq to point P. Now the electric field in intensity at P due to charge dq we will call dE and that will equal rho sub L dz over 4 pi epsilon sub 0 r squared where r is the magnitude of our vector r and a sub r will be a unit vector pointing in the direction of r. If we put a charge q at location p the force that charge q will experience is q times dE. So this expression right here is just Coulomb's law, the force between two charges, charge Q at point P and charge rho sub L dz at this position on our infinite line of charge. I like this connection between Coulomb's law and the electric field intensity to give me a physical feel for the concept of electric field intensity. So let's go back to our expression for the contribution to the electric field intensity just due to charge dq. If we now want to get the total electric field intensity at point P due to all the charges in our line of charge, we would obtain that by integrating from minus infinity to infinity. We could use this technique to find the electric field intensity for any charge distribution. We might not be able to get a nice closed form solution for it, but we could always go to a digital computer and find the electric field intensity at any point. But when we have a nice symmetric charge distribution like the one shown here, we can use Gauss's law to very quickly obtain the electric field intensity. And it also gives us a better mental model, a better physical feel for the relationship between charges and the electric field intensity. So let's go back to our starting charge distribution, our infinite line of charge along the z-axis. Gauss's law tells us that the integral of the electric flux density field over a closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed by that surface. And the electric flux density field is equal to the permittivity times the electric field intensity. And we're just going to assume that we're, we have free space everywhere. Let's see what the symmetry can tell us about the form of the electric flux density field. So let's take two segments of charge, say d sub q1 and d sub q2, and let's look at a point midway between them. So the electric field intensity at point P due to charge d sub q1 will look like this and the electric field intensity at point B due to charge d sub q2 will look like this. And their vector sum will 
only have a component in the a sub rho direction. And notice that if we want to determine the total electric field intensity at our point P here, we can do it by integrating the contributions due to all these charges, but if we think of that summation as taking these things in, in pairs like this, we can see that each pair will only give a contribution in the A sub rho direction. So we can conclude that the electric field intensity at point P has to have the form of only a component in the A sub rho direction. And that will be true at, at any location. So there's no A sub Z or A sub phi component to the electric flux density field or the electric field intensity anywhere in space. In general, the electric flux density field will depend on rho, phi, and z. But what we're going to see is that in, because of the symmetry of our infinite line of charge along the z-axis, there's going to be no phi or z dependence to the electric flux density field and hence the electric field intensity. Our electric flux density field only has an A sub rho component. So looking at our charge along the z-axis, we're depicting the electric flux density field with only that A sub rho component. And if you look down from the positive z-axis, as shown in this figure here to the right, we're again depicting the electric flux density field everywhere as only having an A sub rho component. Now imagine you're sitting at some point here, let's call it point P, and to you what you see is an infinite line of charge in the plus Z and minus Z directions. Now if you were to move in just the Z direction to some new point, P sub 1 here, again all you would see is an infinite line of charge in the minus Z and plus Z directions. Nothing has really changed for you, so the electric flux density field also will not change. So the electric flux density field does not have a Z dependence. Now let's look at another point here, P. And if you move in only the phi direction to some new point, P sub 1 here, from your perspective, nothing has really changed. In fact, you could not tell you're being moved if you're being moved very slowly. So the electric flux density field is also not going to vary with phi. So now for our infinite line of charge, we've argued that the electric flux density field only depends on the rho component, and there is only a component in the A sub rho direction. To apply Gauss's law, we're going to pick a cylindrical Gaussian surface that's aligned with the z-axis. So here's a side view, and the top view would look like this. And so the radius of this cylinder is going to be rho, and we're going to call the length L. And we'll see the length we choose does not matter. It can be some arbitrary value L, or you could pick it to be one meter. So we're going to integrate D dot dS over our Gaussian surface, and it's going to equal the charge enclosed. Now the charge enclosed is just the portion of our infinite line of charge within the cylinder. So that amount of charge will just be the charge density, rho sub L times the length L. So the integral of, of d dot ds will be the integral of d dot ds over the top 
of our Gaussian surface, the integral of d dot ds over the bottom of our Gaussian surface, and the integral of d dot ds on the side of our cylindrical Gaussian surface. Now looking at the bottom and the top, we see that there is no electric flux going through those top and bottom surfaces. So these first two integrals will be zero. Now looking at the integral of d dot ds over the sides, notice that if you're looking at the sides, the electric flux density field everywhere is normal to the side. and the electric flux density field has the same value everywhere on the side. So the integral of d dot ds on the sides will just be the total surface area times the value of the electric flux density field on the side. So the value is d sub rho and the area of the sides is the circumference of the cylinder 2 pi rho times the length of the cylinder L. So we can divide both sides by 2 pi rho times L, and we will get d sub rho is equal to rho sub L over 2 pi rho because the L's will have canceled. So our electric flux density for our infinite line of charge is rho sub L over 2 pi rho times a sub rho. And so the electric field intensity is d sub rho over epsilon sub zero, our permittivity. So E, the electric field intensity, is rho sub L over 2 pi epsilon sub zero rho in the a sub rho direction.